Thank you for all of you for, for joining for this uh, late afternoon session in, in French time. Uh, we're, we're delighted to um, end this uh, very nice uh, workshop with a, a lecture by Maurice Schularik, who is presenting a, a very new project on, on the history of Central Bank and using data on Central Bank balance sheets. So uh, Moritz is a, is a professor at the University of Bern and, uh, and a researcher at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So he has authored, he has authored many papers uh, using historical data to, to inform a lot of theory and policy debates in, uh, in international macro. So we thought it was a, a perfect fit for this uh, lecture today. And, um, and uh, is a new presentation will be discussed by Mathieu Busser, who is a, a director of a monetary policy at the, at the Bank of France. Uh, so the, 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 the lecture will last around 30 minutes and then the discussion by Mathieu will follow and then you will still have time for questions, uh, around 15 minutes of questions uh, afterwards. So we will uh, use the same rules that we have used uh, uh, along the day, meaning that you can uh, ask your questions in the chat or you can just write question and you will be unmuted and allowed to, to talk and and give your uh, your question on remark. Okay, so now uh, I can see your screen, Moritz, so I give you the floor. Well, perfect. I hope you can hear me as well. I hope the gray box has disappeared. I'm not sure it has. It's fine, it's fine. It's totally fine now. It's fine. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Eric. Thank you to Alain and the other organizers for uh, giving me this opportunity for this um, uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, present joint work, and it's really for, it's, it's it's more or less for the first time. Uh, joint work with Neil, Martin, and Paul. I think um, and Martin and Paul might also be um, in the audience, and they can help us um, answer questions and join in the discussion later. The title is Central Bank Balance Sheets in the Macroeconomy. And um, as, as Eric, as you mentioned, we have chosen quite a large time frame. We start really in around 1600 with the first uh, central banks and go all the way to today. So what are we going to do in this? Oh, I should say, um, because of the Fed affiliation, this is, of course, just our opinion and has nothing to do with the central banks. Um, so what are we what are we going to do in this um, in this paper and why? The motivation is 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 as you've mentioned, Eric, is to study a question that has taken prominence in the policy sphere in the recent decades since the global financial crisis, namely central bank balance sheet as an as a policy tool. They have made a comeback, and there is a debate about the macro financial effects the um, role of, of using uh, the balance sheet, the central bank balance sheet for both financial and macroeconomic stabilization. What we do in this, in this project is we take a long run historical perspective. So we're gonna study the evolution of central bank balance sheets and their, um, and their relationship to the macroeconomy in the long run. And that's gonna do one thing that, uh, you know, uh, long run historical studies tend to do namely that unlocks a wealth of historical event studies of balance sheet expansions of fluctuations policy interventions that we hope we can bring to the debate in a fruitful way um, so we're going to study precedents of the global financial crisis and the COVID uh, asset expansions over time um, we will take i think the point uh, on board that uh, institutional environments have changed uh, quite uh, substantially, monetary policy frameworks have changed quite substantially. So when we look at you know lessons and insights from this, uh, we have to keep this in mind, uh, obviously. Um, so what exactly uh, are we going to do? And what we what we do is we will show that balance sheets have reached an unprecedented size relative to GDP, but not relative to financial sector size. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because it it, it has to do with the different, um, you will, um, roles and, and, and mandates of central banks and 
depending on how you look at this stabilization versus financial uh, or macroeconomic stabilization versus financial stability uh, roles, you can come to very different conclusions as to how big that expansion is that we've seen in recent um, decades or the past 10 years and how we should think about that. Um, we will document something that is very well known to the historical community, but probably a good reminder to the macro crowd out there, namely that there's been a gradual shift in balance sheet use from, from basically from government finance, from war finance towards and a reluctant assumption of financial stability mandates basically starting in the 19th century, although there have been um, sporadic cases of that in earlier decades. Um, more recently, there's been central bank balances have become a policy tool, a monetary policy tool at the effective or zero lower bound for interest rates. And we're going to talk about that uh, briefly. The main empirical part for those of you who are really uh, more into, okay, so what can we, what is the empirical uh, economic um, key um, and strategy and key question that this paper addresses is that we, we're going to zoom in on the lender of last resort function of um, central banks in financial crisis. So one very frequent, and we've seen this in, in the last, in last March, we've seen it in 2008-9, a frequent uh, use and essential uh, way how uh, authorities fight financial crises and panics in financial markets is to use the balance sheet of the central bank as a lender of last resort, providing liquidity to financial institutions who have trouble um, um, financing their assets, getting funding either because of run-like situations in funding markets, because of um, a lot of bad assets on their, or potentially bad assets on their balance sheet that the market is not quite sure how to value and and um, the and not and is not willing to provide short-term liquidity. So we're going to zoom in on those and we're going to study the causal effects. And I've used this like very uh, loaded word causal in a, you know, with a twinkle in the eye. Um, we're going to have an identification strategy that we think gets us to um, actually like probably may, maybe, um, and correct, correct me if I'm wrong, um, for the first time at the sort of a quantification with a good shot at Saying like this is actually probably the, the these are the effects of central bank interventions and not some um, not some other unobserved factors. Um, how the land of last resort function reduces uh, or affects the cost uh, of or the the real economic cost of financial crises and alleviates trouble in financial markets. And um, the way we're going to do this is uh, shown here and I'm just going to give it away and then you have the framing for later when we get to that. So to say something about what are the effects, the economic and financial effects of central bank responses to financial crisis using that the balance sheet as a land of last resort to um, to cushion the panic, to uh, provide stability and liquidity when, um, you know, when a manic depressive financial sector runs into trouble, is we're going to use we need exogenous variation in the central bank response and we think we have quite a neat idea and instrument to um to determine that so essentially what we're going to use is we're going to use the ideological attitude or the upbringing if you will the world view of the central bank governor typically a man um before the financial crisis and we're going to assume that the crisis probability Sort of that ideological, the, the probability of having a crisis is largely orthogonal to the ideological attitude of the governor before the financial shock hits. It's not anticipated. That's what's a financial shock. Um, so there's very, there's no reason to believe that um, this is any um, is is you know is is endogenous to to the emergence of the crisis. So and we can use this pre-existing ideological disposition, and we can see if that's actually correlated with the crisis response of the central bank when the crisis hits. And that's going to be our first stage, if you will. We're going to say, OK, do we find in the data evidence that governors who um, were hawkish before the crisis, yeah, so there's no, there's no feedback here, we're going to classify governors as hawkish or dovish or on this ideological spectrum long before the crisis strikes. Is there evidence that more hawkish governors 
are much less inclined to use the land of last resort, to use the balance sheet, to be a land of last resort um, uh, in, in the crisis period. And we'll find you know, reasonably strong evidence that the first stage works well. Hawkish governors are less likely, much less likely to, um, um, to use the central bank balance sheet, open it up for, fi uh, for financial sector liquidity and, and funding needs. Uh, since this, uh, we can then use that um, that uh, correlation, so explain the variation in central bank responses to financial crises um, by the pre-existing ideologically ideological differences in 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 the governors. And so, in the second stage, we're going to use that governor ideology as an instrument, and we're going to look at the effects um, that use that exogenous variation. Um, to study the effects. And what we find, and this is what sort of made the main point and one that might make much here and other central bankers in the room really happy, is that we find that uh, central bank land of last, last resort operations in financial crisis indeed have large stabilizing effects. Yeah. Um, and I'm run, gonna run you through what exactly we mean by uh, stabilizing effects, it's gonna be effects on output, on inflation and on bank lending. Okay. That is the that's the outline data. We have annual balance sheet uh, central bank data for what is it 500 years, um, almost. Um, we have the size, we have the composition. We um, have government debt, GDP data. We include some early nine early central banks: Bank of Naples, Royal Bank of Prussia, Bank of, bank of Hamburg, Riksbank et al. Um, I'm going to show you some very long run trends um, for the empirical analysis of the land of last resort function. We're going to focus on the last 150 years. And we're going to use a bunch of historical primary secondary sources to do that classification. Um, this, that's something that uh, we spend a lot of time uh, doing and um, coming up with a classification that we're happy with and thinking this is this is this provides a, a good frame to think about um, the ideological predisposition. And the data will be available as usual on the macro history and our macro history uh, database and, and the website. Okay, so let's start with some charts. This is the Riggs Bank, central bank assets over GDP, the Riggs Bank from late 17th century to today. Um, you see uh, major fluctuations. Um, you see that in the case of Riggs Bank, um, the war finance in the 18th century led to expansions that were larger than today, but you can also see that for the first central bank or first modern central bank, if you will, these um, the recent expansion indeed is is one that's historically uh, noticeable maybe um maybe a little bit closer to um the research interests of of, of people in the room uh, the bank of england uh, where you can see that indeed the, the relative to gdp the central bank balance sheet expansion in the last decade is the largest on record um much larger than you know well-known episodes during the um, napoleonic wars during the south sea bubble um and the, the and the wars in the 18th century um, and also much larger than, for example, in World War II. Um, this is 30% um, of GDP is indeed for the Bank of England a historical rate. If we bring them together, um, the, the sample here varies and, and the, the, um, the, um, the notes tell you exactly what's in there. So take this with a grain of salt, but if we do this very long run panorama, uh, you see this here. Um, for a group of now 15, 17 economies, depending on depending on the, the time period, you see that the large expansions in World War I and World War II, sort of in, in, early 20, in the early 20th century, are pale in comparison to what we've seen recently. Um, we've seen very large expansions in uh, in number of countries that um, now mean that relative to GDP, central bank balances probably have never been uh, bigger than before. There's going to be a however, and this however starts with uh, starts on this chart with a share of public debt held by uh, central banks, so the share of government debt in total central bank assets. And here the picture is more nuanced. Um, yes, central bank balance sheets have grown a lot, and yes, the central banks have bought a lot of government debt, but as percent of um, the balance sheet, um, I guess that's something that matters very much for debates about fiscal dominance that are, are currently ongoing. The um, we are you know we are back at wartime levels, no question. We are back where we were in World War II in, in many countries, 
Um, but we haven't seen quite a dramatic, quite as a dramatic expansion as uh, on the GDP side. Um, and the most interesting for me uh, charge, if we look at these long run trends, is the following: is this one where central bank assets are not scaled by GDP, but are scaled by the size of the financial sector. And that relates to a, a question that goes to the heart of the mandate of central banks, namely. Uh, one is stabilization policy, as it's become to, yeah, as it's defined essentially. We've heard about Bretton Woods earlier. Since the end of the Bretton Woods, central banks have assumed a very broad-based and compassing stabilization mandate, um, stabilizing output and inflation, or only inflation in some um, some places. Um, you know, there's mandate reviews under underway, and and some of the core ideas I think that under that were underlying. The focus on inflation only, like divine coincidence, um, it, it may be no longer quite uh, so much en vogue in, in new models where uh, they're heterogeneous agents and things are a little bit more complicated than in the simple new Keynesian world with representative agents. But that's a side debate. Uh, financial sector size here is um, is aggregate is the total balance sheet size uh, of total lending of the non of the banks of the financial sector to the non-financial sector. So this is essentially um, bank loans to the non-financial sector. So in some cases it covers um, non-bank lending in the US and where we have data, I think we have some data uh, also for Switzerland, um, but essentially this is um, uh, the total, think of this as the total um, loan book to the non-financial sector of the balance sheets uh, of the banks in, in 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 these countries, and the point here is, and and I think that's something to that we want to think about. The second mandate of central banks, if you think about the financial stability mandate, um, you can say that um, relative to the bulk of to the amount of assets, to the size of assets that's out there, that the uh, central bank balance sheet, if you will, ensures in a in a panic or in a crisis. Um, the what is what is what is striking is how much uh, that has actually shrunk in the call it sort of in the past 30 or 40 years of financial liberalization. Essentially, what has happened is that um, central bank balance sheet, while they've expanded relative to GDP, um, the financial sector has expanded much more than GDP. So, relative to the financial size of the financial sector, relative to bank lending, um, we are actually nowhere near the peaks where we've been in the interwar period, but even in the 19th century. Now, you think this is a good approximation of how um, large the central balance sheet is, or a good approximation of this uh, lender of last resort functions stabilizing the financial sector, then that recent large expansion that we've seen relative to GDP, remind you of that chart that you'll see often in the news or in the papers, looks much more tame here. And um, I think there's a tension that we need to think about for the financial stability mandate. Arguably, the size of the insured pool of assets, if you will, is the relevant is the relevant um, 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 relevant macro um, financial variable. So that might mean we're actually here to stay. Um, the central banks have a larger pool of assets to insure, and that. Um, we were, we might turn the table around and say, what was central banks thinking pre 2008 that they could skate on such thin eyes where, um, the financial sector has grown so much and their balance sheets were still very, very small, um, ensuring an ever larger pool of assets with an ever, or with a very small amount of, um, central bank firepower, if you will. Okay. Um, I leave that. Let's focus on some expansions here. We're looking at large expansions. Uh, of more than, I believe it's 15% uh, of GDP. And what you can see here, and this is what I mentioned in the introduction, is um, the shift of the inter uh, shift of interventions, uh, expand central bank expansions from green to red. Green is war and revolution. This is countries fighting wars and central banks doing what they were founded for, making sure that the government has access to finance. Uh, red is the mandate that if you look here in the late 19th century, that's when you know global finance, modern finance took off and uh, central banks assumed the second role reluctantly, 
And uh, at first, with considerable private sector involvement, we, you know, you this is the famous budget idea of you lend freely against a panel at a penalty rate. Um, these days, we lend freely, and uh, there is no penalty. You see, this role has dominated central bank balance sheet expansions in the second half of the 20th century. That sharp um, orangey yellow bar here is is the COVID expansion. There is a you know there is a debate about uh, how do how you class classify central bank um, liquidity injections after uh, financial crises uh, after pandemics and natural catastrophes because in the end what has happened is of course that central banks have prevented a collapse of funding markets of stabilized bond markets so you can as well classify this as a financial crisis as a financial stability expansion. Uh, that is um, so as a make, make as a red bar. Uh, the the nature of the intervention is the same. There's a large financial sector. There's leveraged interlocking balance sheets, and there's a just there's an external shock hitting them, creating questions about the sustainability um, and of some of these balance sheets and uh, funding being withdrawn at a rapid pace and central banks stepping in and calming the situation. So in a way the a pandemic or natural catastrophe response to uh, by central banks is nothing else but a typical lend of last resort function in a financial uh, stability event. Um, only with the one nice exceptions uh, that this is really an exogenous shock. Um, you know, we often talk about financial crisis being, um, you know, exogenous shocks to the system. Well, most of the time, they're of course not. They're endogenous to um, developments in the financial sector, the endogenous to credit booms and asset price booms um, with financial uh, with pandemics and natural catastrophes. These are actually really nice, um, really nice um, events where um, the um, the central bank responds to shocks that come from outside the financial sector and prevents them from spilling over from being magnified and amplified by finance. So we want to think about Sort of the financial frictions, literature and macro, the Gertler, uh, Bernanke, uh, Gilchrist, Gertler ideas about Gertler, Gilchrist ideas about financial accelerators, um, and or Kiyotaki Moore papers. Then this is this is the idea of an amplification that people have in mind. Um, there are, and I think that's good news for the macro folks out there. They are rare, but there are these instances when actually finance is an amplifier of an external shock hitting the economy. I think most financial historians would say most of the time finance is the source of the shock and these financial friction papers um, kind of have the causality upside down. There was a question about the residual um, gray bars. These are typically revaluation um, events under fixed exchange rate. There's, there's devaluations, revaluations that lead to large, call it gains on, on in the size of the balance sheet. Um, but that have not to do directly with sort of active central bank expansion of the balance sheet. Okay, here's an over time. It's the same message I gave you, and I want to talk about in my last uh, few minutes. I want to talk about our um, our empirical uh, part that gives you an idea about what the effects of these interventions are. This is a timeline of um, the probability of, occur of of seeing a central bank expansion in a five year. In a 10 year window, I'm sorry, uh, blue is war revolution. This is government finance events, yellowish. Uh, we should probably align these colors at some point so it's not so confusing. The yellow or beige bar line is the probability of having a central, seeing a central bank balance sheet expansion in that sample driven by a financial stability, a financial crisis event. And you see that uh, outside the wars and in the second half of the 20th century, it's that uh, that has been, that's become the main a role for central bank balance sheet um, usage. Okay, this top end, I'll leave that. And I want to talk about um, the last part. Uh, I mentioned most of this, the shifting motivation and um, early large balance sheet expansions during wars and in financial crisis. Okay, last part, the effects of the land of last resort function. And we're kind of proud that we have this idea and um, you can, you, we're happy to take even sharp criticism if you think this doesn't make any sense and doesn't get us closer. But I think it's one of the very big questions out there in macro finance is what is the economic financial value of having a central bank, of having a land of last resort? And if you want to summarize the debate that's been raving in, in econ and finance for 
I guess more than two centuries, or at least a century now, it's, you know, to, to, to use Bernanke's book title, it's the courage to act versus the urge to purge. So is there a point, what's the relative merit of the argument that in crises, the central bank needs to step in because the market gets it wrong or because of frictions, think about diamond divic type maturity transformation frictions, um, the market left to itself would produce a catastrophic outcome. Um, that's, I think, the Bernanke, the courage to act view. Um, we have to step in, provide liquidity, because just as there are bubbles on the upside, there are fire cell dynamics and maybe bubbles on the downside when people become too pessimistic. And the central bank has a role to play to stop these spirals and to stabilize, maybe even stabilize the price of risk, uh, which is, I think, uh, an idea that in on both sides of the Atlantic has gained some currency in the central banking world that um, there is a correct price of risk and central banks sometimes have to help the market get to that cent right, correct price of risk. The other view is the urge to purge, the Andrew Mellon view, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate everything because it will purge the rottenness out of the system. You know, you can call it the, the Schumpeterian view of you know, there is no point in saving a big insurance company that has played with its customer money. Um, it's much healthier, after all, for the system if those players leave the system and not are not stabilized with public money. So effectively, in economic terms, this is a moral hazard versus stabilization role. And it's been out there for a long time, and we think we have a decent shot at actually answering that question. What's the identification strategy? I mentioned it. It's pre-existing government ideology. So we um, identify central bank government policy ideologies relying on narrative and quantitative sources. I'm sorry, this slide is far too full. I have two historical co-authors on this project and they like to put a lot of information on slides. Um, it's for ADD economists, you know, who can't take more than three information at the same time, it's definitely too much. But effectively what we're doing is we go through biographies, speeches, media assessments, um, and um, we hope there's not too much hindsight bias because in obituaries there might be, but definitely what we're trying to do is have information before the crisis on like where are these people from, where did they graduate, what's their policy view, are they interventionist or are they dovish, are they interventionist and dovish or are they hawkish and hands off. Whenever we have career bureaucrats um, who are like, you know, um, just basically appointed by government, like like Funk in Nazi Germany, or just basically like treasury employees that get lent out from the central bank to the, we, we call them neutral because they don't, they don't have a view and they basically are, are gray bureaucrats. Um, here's an example for France, for, for Labéry in the, in the 30s. Um, we call him as a dove because he's very nice, he's very attuned to popular front ideology. Um, he was, you know, there's plenty of it. Sorry, we don't have the accents here in the, in the French, so apologies for the for missing out on them. But basically, this is an example for a, a, a famous dove, if you will, um, going to Bank of Canada. We um, um, we have, here's an example for, for a hawk who has been very anti-inflationist and um, strict, strict monetarist, um, doesn't want to be uh, involved with anything that um, could possibly uh, be um, seen as being pro-finance, being too dovish, who's really like an anti-inflation uh, uh, hawk. And we, we, we classify uh, this gentleman as a, as, a, as a classic hawk. Yeah? And uh, so this is how our full set then looks from 1870 to today. Um, the, and the, the gray ones, um, you know, there's uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, for example. Um, we have Bernanke as a dove. There is a there is a good, uh, there's a good cause also to call him maybe a neutral. Um, um, I'm mentioning this and criticizing our own work here, Bernanke's up here, uh, because it doesn't matter. Because for empirical analysis, we're going to put the doves into neutrals in one bin, and we're just going to like pick the real hawks because we think it's very hard to distinguish dovish and neutral stance. But there are some characters in central bank history and financial history who are real hawks and those we want to, um, those we want to capture. Okay, so um, the coding balance is quite good. Hawks, pragmatists, or neutrals, we should call them neutrals or pragmatists throughout. Um, apologies for that. Um, it looks pretty good. This is the first event sort of um, um, study, namely the probability or the share of 
having large expansions in, in financial crises for hawkish and dovish governors. And uh, that's important for us because there is a difference. If you look at year zero, this is the one of when the sort of financial crisis hits year one, two, three after, you see that the doves are much more likely to have and have to like be to sign off to large balance sheet expansion or to initiate them. Yeah. Uh, we we run these statistical tests and they are the, the, the differences in the responses. It's a little complicated because of the probabilities, but uh, for the first two years, um, for zero, one, two, zero, zero, one and two, they are statistically different. So those three years that are most relevant, um, we we want to capture. Okay, first event study, and then the rest flows from there. And I'm going to give the floor to Mathieu in just a second. Is um, uh, do we see differences in uh, in the response of hawkish and dovish governors? Um, in terms of economic outcomes. So left hand side here on the in this chart is the real GDP and the right hand side is central bank assets. And you see the doves ex uh, GDP performs better under under um, doves and central bank assets expand much more under doves than under hawks. But of course, this could be endogenous. There could be all kinds of unobserved factors. So this is going to be uh, what we are interested in in the second in the in the instrumental variable strategy. Just, so we're going to see if this still holds once we only use the variation in the central bank response that's caused by predetermined ideology. Um, okay, I think I've said all this uh, disentangle liquidity injection shaping crisis severity. Um, we, the identifying assumption is that pre-crisis beliefs are orthogonal to financial crisis severity. I think that's a fair. I mean, we can't prove that, but I think that's a fair assumption to make. Happy to discuss that, and then we're going to we're going to instrument. Um, the balance sheet response with that, uh, with that ideological predisposition. This is the first stage. Um, significant um, um, response. Uh, governors mid hawkish beliefs are much less likely to have lots to, to initiate large balance sheet expansions. Um, the timing, just to understand the charts that are coming, we're going to use the Baron Bernersion classification. So not our own. For one reason, they are in the end, they look very similar and they're qualitatively the same. But what Baron Bernice Young do, if you remember, is they code um, a crisis in the year where the bank stocks drop a lot. So that's the that's the starting phase of the crisis. Whereas in our own with Alan and, and Oscar, our own sort of narrative banking crisis classification, we tend to classify the peak of the crisis when the banks actually when banks actually go under or when um, you know, there's large spread systemic panic. Um, and what we, we switched to this early and, and relative to ours, the Baron Metz and, and Emil's and, and Ways classifications often a year earlier. And we want to capture that because we want to have that. We want to give central banks a chance to uh, react as quickly as possible. So we're going to have H0 is going to be the start year. And then there's, um, and we're going to go, we're going to measure expansions in the start year and then the first year after the start. And we're going to see what difference that makes. Um, we're going to run a bunch of local projections, instrumented um, this uh, central bank balance sheet expansion with the ideological differences. And I'm just going to show you the result because it's nice and strong is that um, indeed um, the this is the path with the, when the central bank balance sheet expansion becomes 30 percent more likely. So that's the experiment we run. That's when the likelihood of um, of, a, of an expansion is higher, i.e. when you go into a crisis with a non-hawkish governor and you see the crisis path is much shallower, GDP recovers quicker, uh, the, the hawks are much more, have much more severe crises, uh, inflation, the deflation threat is much contained and bank lending uh, picks off uh, much closer. Uh, this has country fixed effects and netted out. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that we control for. Um, business cycle controls, the preceding credit, size of the preceding credit boom, uh, policy rate changes. So we look at the response of interest rates as well. We look at government uh, expenditures. We look at bank capital ratios. We look at all controls. Oops, that goes back too far. Um, let me just slide back. And um, the this is for this is for policy rate changes. This is all controls, and the results remain very similar. Yeah, so this is like so we control for all the observables. And in the end, what stays is that we have a large makes it it makes it really makes a difference. Maybe we should call this paper what a difference a governor makes or something. Um, we really makes a difference whether you go into a crisis as a country with a governor 
that is a hawk versus a dove. And if you believe that identification assumption, that means that the lender of last resort function of central banks is really valuable in crisis times. And uh, Mathieu has chosen the right employer. Um, and he provides a real public service. And with that, I hand over to Mathieu. Sorry for taking five minutes longer after all. So before I start, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to, to discuss this paper. I really enjoyed uh, the, the, the paper. I think it's uh, it's really great and, and very interesting. And let me also congratulate the organizers for putting together a really outstanding uh, uh, work uh, so program for the uh, for the workshop today. Uh, so, given that the presentation was uh, was labeled as a keynote uh, address, I, I will start with some fairly general considerations. Um, but so, the first one I'd like to say is, uh, working in a in a central bank, I, I try to pay a close attention to uh, papers that relate to economic history. And uh, the reason for this is, of course, that uh, central bankers don't change the course of monetary policy every day. Um, so we don't have many observations and many events uh, to to use to to assess the effect of our measures. And so for this, either you try to gain um, more observations by using a panel of countries, but then of course the problem is are the, the different countries comparable or you extend the, the panel dimension in the, in the T uh, dimension and you try to get longer uh, time series. Uh, but I would say that beyond this, uh, this obvious effect, uh, it's particularly useful in crisis times uh, to look at this past episodes. So, because in crisis times, you really need to think out of the box and, um, you know, go back and see what uh, did our predecessors do? Did that work? What were the reactions at the time? And so, what would be the, the lessons for, for the current times? And another um, reason why it's so interesting to look at economic history is that some of the mechanisms at stake take a very long time to unfold. So, think of a relation between money and inflation. Uh, it's there, but you need to filter the, the data series um, really a lot to, to, to see something. Uh, or if I take an example from international macro, purchasing power parity, we know the half-life is very long. Um, or to take uh, another example from this morning's discussion, global currencies, uh, they, they can take a lot of time to, um, to evolve and to, to be replaced. Uh, so that's all uh, completely welcome. Uh, but of course, there are caveats in doing this. And just to state the obvious, uh, the first one is, uh, is, is the experience really comparable uh, across these different observations? So the counter argument is always this time is different. And while this is a, you know, a general point, uh, there is a specific aspect that we'll, I will discuss in the context of, uh, of today's paper, um, you know, why that may be a concern and things to, to control for. Uh, and another, another point to mention is, are, are the data reliable? So, uh, I, I also added this uh, citation, but I think it's obvious to, uh, to to all of you because you're economic historians. So uh, when asked uh, the impact about the impact of the French Revolution, the usual answer is too early to tell. And so we, we need a long, long time series uh, to look at. So with these general considerations in, in, in mind, um, let me go more specifically to, to the paper. I think it's really uh, promising. So I only had the slides, not uh, not the paper. So by the way, Moritz, uh, feel free to ignore everything I, I'm going to say. Maybe it's just reflecting my uh, uh, lack of proper understanding. But uh, uh, so I, I really thought looking at the slides that the, the motivation and so the, the angle that you chose is really excellent. Uh, again, speaking from a central banking perspective, it's true that our balance sheets have increased uh, very, very substantially post-COVID. So what are the long-run implications of this? Uh, I, I think it's also welcome the focus on the lender of last resort uh, role of, uh, of central banks. There's made probably more papers looking at um, you know, money and inflation, and I guess fewer papers looking at uh, this aspect of central banks. Uh, and also, I think what's really welcome and uh, and a good um, asset for your paper is the, this narrative identification of the central bank governors. So looking at their ideological attitude, I think it's a smart way to uh, identify the effect that you're focusing on. Uh, and uh, there's a growing literature of people who, who did that. Let me advertise the work of Claudia Nystrefi at the Banque de France. She has a number of papers. Uh, and in fact, um, in some cases, you you label the governors slightly differently. So I, I'll return to this later on. And so um, I think your paper is going to be well positioned in the in the literature. Uh, I liked also the so both the standard facts and the analysis. I I think that the I was uh, fascinated by the uh, the time plots of the central bank uh, balance sheet uh, using different. Uh, 
scaling variables uh, and, and uh, finding that the balance sheets are large with respect to GDP, but not financial variables. Uh, and also, I think the, the results that you have, uh, which I understand are preliminary, but they are very intuitive. Uh, so the dose versus hooks, uh, they do uh, what they are expected to do and the, the uh, effect that you get uh, confirms intuition. So that's always a, uh, a comforting feeling. So overall, I really enjoyed reading the, the slides and I very much look forward to the paper. So um, in, in, in doing so, I have a, I have a few questions and, and maybe again, that's uh, Feel free to to ignore um, uh, these questions that, that may be uh, clearer when you when you write the paper. But maybe some points to focus on when when you draft uh, the paper. The first uh, maybe reaction I had was um, so the concept of uh, lender of last resort is in fact fairly new. So by this I have to qualify new by the standards of this workshop. So uh, going back five hundred years um, uh, five hundred years ago. Um, so taking a very long historical perspective. So are the concepts of doves and hawks uh, really meaningful here? And maybe for monetary policy, I could see the point and for financial stability, there's a bit more of a question mark and it may be the case, uh, but uh, when you draft a paper, I think it's going to be important to uh, really give a sense whether the governors from uh, you know so many years ago, they had this sense that they had a lender of last resort role for all the central banks that you are describing, and that that was these concepts really apply uh, going back so many years ago, and that's related to the fact that financial markets um, were not so developed at the time, uh, and and especially the the notion that some banks can have a systemic uh, effect, and so need, need to be safe. So, but that's uh, again, you're you're more of a specialist of the economic history than, than I am. So maybe these points were obvious. Uh, back in the 19th century or earlier, um, but I think it would be useful to document the, these points in the in the paper. Now I turn to the classification, and and here I'm based on slide 18. So just okay, so some some reactions as uh, related to this. One one thing is of course a difficulty for you is the ECB because it's a monetary union. So um, you know why um, so. so is it just the president of the ECB that, that matters um, or the general um, composition of the, of the governing council? I, um, I had a question here, which was why uh, do the data differ in the table across your area countries, but exposed I understood that it's because they didn't have the crisis at the same time. So for Portugal, you extend into, into Draghi, uh, but for, for the other countries, you stop at, uh, at Jean-Claude Trichet being the, the president. So. So that I understood, but that's still a question. I think when there is a committee, how you how you take that uh, into account? Um, on the on the table, so it looks like um, there was nothing between 1930 and 1990, almost like the, there's a big chunk in the table which is which is blank. And so I was I was wondering, is it true there was no uh, no banking or financial crisis uh, at the time? So that raises the question: how you define the financial crisis? I'll turn to that later on. And also, I mean, I, I, I wrote why stop in 2010, but that's, I guess, because you, I guess your estimation goes until 2020, but you don't have banking crisis maybe in the, in the latest, latest uh, part. Uh, but that, that could be a point to clarify. So when does, uh, when do you start and when do you end, um, and, and perhaps even country by country. But so also on the, on the classification, uh, the question is, who was in charge? So independence of the central banks is still fairly recent. So still speaking in a in a, in no, with a normal concept of uh, what's recent. So um, you know, it's independence of the central banks. I think was gained in the past um, 20, 30 years. Uh, uh, maybe maybe a bit longer for some of the uh, central banks. But uh, so who who was in charge of the decisions 100 years ago? And I think you. Um, refer to that in the in the slide saying that sometimes you actually give the ideological attitude of the minister of finance, not not the central banker, uh, which you know could could well be it. But I I still had this question, you know, who is who is in charge? Um, and in some cases, again, the the central bank is represented not by just one person, but by a committee. And so, how do you how do you treat that? So that was some of the some of the questions I had. Some further question is how are the banking crises defined? I, I 
I miss that. And also maybe how systemic is the crisis and shouldn't that be added as a control? So do you distinguish between a, you know, a localized crisis or a, you know, a very large crisis? I mean, maybe there could be something to be uh, learned from the distinction between the global crisis and, uh, and the country specific crisis, because in the global, in the case of global crisis, you can really say it's exogenous. But I'll return to the possible endogeneity of the, of the crisis, uh, I think in the next slide. Um, so yeah, I, I, I miss that. Another thing I noticed is the, in your first stage regression, you have pretty low R squared. And so usual question for instruments is, uh, how strong are they? Um, I was thinking in some cases you could add control variables, um, and you put some in the, in the appending. So you, you, you sent me the full, uh, the full deck and, uh, but you didn't have time to present it. So in the case of fiscal policy, you, um, I think you you did that uh, at some point, but uh, I think these are important questions because uh, so monetary policy is not the only game in town and, and wasn't the only game in town uh, going back over so many years. So maybe fiscal policy was also used or other tools. I um, so that would be useful to to control for and and explain further in the um, in the paper. Um, Another question I had was, uh, so you're labeling the, the governors as hawks and doves, and that's already difficult. And you did such a, you know, an important work in, uh, you know, doing this classification going back so many years. Um, I was wondering whether the hawks and doves were faithful to their reputation. So I think some of them switched as you, as you've mentioned, uh, that's interesting. I, I think in the paper, you, that would be really interesting to look at what happened for these people. Um, but I was thinking also maybe some of them switch throughout. So I don't know how consistent, how persistent they were in their uh, orientation. And, you know, I refer to this paper by Claudia Nystrophy. Um, and uh, you may want to have a close look because I think you're putting Alan Greenspan not in the same category. And it could be that uh, depending when exactly you look at his statements, he, he switched from hawks and, and doves. But uh, uh, I refer you to, to her papers. Um, another thing that wasn't clear to me is I, um, so in the title, you, you, uh, the paper, you uh, mentioned the year 1587 as, as the starting point, but if I am not mistaken, but again, maybe I, uh, I misunderstood in the, in the estimation, I think you start later than that. You start in the 19th century. So you have different, uh, uh <laughs> there's a cat, uh, <laughs> interrupting you, uh, <laughs> But uh, so so that that would be one thing to to clarify because uh, so if I understand correctly maybe you have style aspects going back so many years but the estimation is on a shorter sample but that that would be worth clarifying. Um, and I think that's I have two more slides and then I stop. Uh, one thing so this slide is actually summarizing your results from that's really taken from from your slides and so. I guess, uh, um, you know, I can only reiterate that it's very clear and very uh, intuitive what, what you found so very um, plausible and, uh, um, but one question I had, and, and you've actually mentioned that in the presentation is, uh, you know, what would be the effect? So you're, you're still taking uh, as an exogenous event. Um, so the, the, the banking crisis are exogenously determined uh, but one one question would be: Are they affected by the ideological attitude of the central bankers? And in fact, I've seen in the chat there's uh, there was a very similar question. So that would be very interesting. One thing you could do, which is easy, is to run a, um, a logit regression, and you're just regressing the probability of the crisis or the occurrence of crisis on um, the ideological attitude of the of the governors. And maybe it's insignificant, and in which case you would be on a, on safe ground. But if it's not, that would be also be interesting because of all the more hazard argument that if you're dovish, then you are triggering a crisis. Uh, so just to summarize, a uh, very interesting, promising paper. Both uh, the standard facts are interesting in themselves and the analysis that you're conducting. I very much look forward to the paper and uh, hopefully the a few points that I have mentioned will uh, um, be help help you will be helpful for you one way or the other, and I uh, stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you so well, much, Mathieu. Very helpful. I, I to, to take five minutes to respond to Mathieu's comments. Uh, 
before we you know what eric i think these were excellent comments just thank you so much Mathieu. it's early stages for the project and we're going to take on uh, a lot of uh, take on board basically everything you say um to a lot of the things i don't have the points you i don't have a good answer we need to look into it we need to compare to um thanks for pointing out uh, the the work by strephy uh we need to, we will compare this uh, make these things a little bit clearer i really do like your last point um about um the question like there's a big debate about the moral hazard and if there if moral hazard is an issue maybe uh, we would could see that in the uh, Dutch governors actually do increase crisis risk over time or associate with that you know, it gets like oh, what kind of governments get in, get put in office when there is risk of financial instability. You get into kind of other indigenous issues, but I think that's a super interesting question. Um, and um, I am um, so in, in that case, uh, Eric, I'm very happy to open up for the discussion. I'm also happy for uh, my co-authors to come in if they are um, if they want to to respond. But this was um, exceedingly helpful. And I uh, have a whole page of notes that um, we're going to uh, implement. The um, I think uh, I think the 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 the, the, the core issue of um, to what extent um, does ideological difference in terms of monetary policy, you know, whether you're more or less inflationist um, or spill over into hawkishness and dovishness for land of last resort operations is something that um i didn't um i didn't think of and i think it's a very important point and i think we need to we need to we probably need to and can do better because i can't see what you mentioned i can't see a governor being having like a stuff like a tough monitorist stance and being like um inflation is is a real net present danger but at the same time, when it comes to like budget style financial sector operations, uh, not be necessarily a very uh, a hawkish at the same time. So, um, you know, where you stand on kind of Phillips curve trade offs and where you stand on um, 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 financial interventions in crisis times might be two different ideological uh, matrices, matrices in effect. And I think we need to look into it. I leave it here. Um, all right. Happy for. Um, there were interesting questions in the chat. We, I think, I could answer some, but I'm happy for you to lead the discussion. Thank I you. I see Arno wants to, yeah. wants to jump in. He's... I see Arno too, so Arno, if you want to, to jump in. Feel free. Uh, I, I don't have a... Well, actually, I, I, have, I have a suggestion to make. I just wanted to say hello to Moritz and Mathieu, so I <laughs> just took this opportunity. So. Um, I, I was thinking of, of another instrument uh, that you could possibly use among the, the various dimensions that, that, that Matthew highlighted, is, you know, possible differences between now and then. Um, one is whether the central bank is public or private. I don't know whether, whether you explore that, but you could think of, um, you know, public central bank as, as being something relatively, relatively recent in the, in, in the long um, period of history that you cover. And it could be that the fact that central bank moved away from being privately owned towards being publicly owned as changing their utility function and, and, and the objective that they pursue. You know, the conference is hosted by the Banque de France, which was often criticized as defending the interest of 200 fam rich families in France, uh, especially during the, the Great Depression. Um, and after the war, it moved to, to something different where, um, where public, public interests, whatever they may be, uh, were pursued. So perhaps that gives you um, another angle um, to, to, to look at. Um, this strategy. Having said that, I'm, I'm glad to see you again, uh, even if it's, uh, if it's virtually. So, would you like to answer, Mar Moritz? Uh, no, thanks, Anna. It's, no, it's, it's a very nice idea. I had actually, I was, when you said that, I was thinking about, um, about, I mean, this maybe slightly off topic, but I was thinking that we have, that there's, there's a current debate again about um what is the public mission of central banks and in what sense does for example very accommodative policy help um you know help uh, wealth rich households versus income poor households so i think these questions are still with us and i was thinking yeah i mean this is exactly what a lot of people are worried about today again that uh, 
um, it's not clear how you can how you define the public interest from a central. What what, what is the central bank um, optimize? And um, you know, I think I guess it's very hard for for you or for Mathieu to comment on that. Um, I think um, you know with the with the certainty that has crumbled with the sort of representative agent New Keynesian framework. Um, it's not clear that all these things that we um, were so like that that meant that we didn't have to think about these issues like divine coincidence. You know, you stabilize inflation and it's you automatically stabilize output and everything is fine. Um, or um, you know, uh, welfare functions, etc. All of this with if if we all sign up to this new heterogeneous agent framework now, all of these things are up in the air all of a sudden. You know, stabilizing inflation doesn't mean necessarily that you stabilize output. Um, it doesn't mean you might have a very different, you need to think about again, how you think about gains in parts of the distribution versus gains on average, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this, it's, it's fascinating how these questions just keep coming back. And, um, and, and so your comment was very, very, uh, um, so we're going to use that definitely in the paper because it also makes this question again, very relevant. Thanks. So if I may, I see no other questions right now. So I have two two brief questions. So the first one is that is the way you define back, uh, central bank balance sheet expansion, uh, because an issue that may come up, and I'm sure you're aware of that, but especially some central banks when they were in a fixed exchange rate regime, especially during the gold standard, actually where when there is a banking crisis, maybe they are not they are not lending to the banks, they are not playing a lender of last resort role, but actually they are going to accumulate foreign foreign reserves, so either foreign exchange or even gold. So there is like if if you come back to the French example of nineteen during the Great Depression, they are not playing the role of lender of last resort, but they are accumulating gold. So there is a balance sheet expansion of the central bank. So you will get very different results if you look at the at the loan of the central banks to to the banks, or if you look at the total assets. And I, I was wondering what, what you and um and second remark also linked to that. But something that had always been um, quite intriguing to me when when I look at this uh, statistics of a uh, balance sheet of central banks as a share of GDP in the long run is that there are huge fixed effect. I mean there. Are, have very big differences across countries, and in some ways, it's you see some some constant in, in, in that. So, and um, uh, and I was wondering whether you look also at the, at the non-linearity of that, because maybe the effect might be different of whether the central banks already had a very large share of the bank, especially of the banking sectors, because we we know that especially even until the 1980s. Some central banks played a role in financing directly the economy and when also one of the main bank of the country. Thanks, Eric. Yes, a very good point. I think we, we, we have the data so we can look at the asset composition of the balance sheet expansion and we can look at, we can filter out the reserve driven ones or the gold driven ones. Um, and we can probably, I mean, at some point we might run into um, you know, trouble because the number of observations is not huge. You know, it's the same kind of hundred systemic crises that everyone that we have in the last hundred, hundred fifty years. Um, but uh, we can we can definitely try that, and we can also look at the difference um, between fixed and floating uh, regimes. Um, thinking, okay, hopefully we have enough observations. I realized I I, I really didn't. Um, say so much because probably this is just so much um everyday business for me so i didn't answer matthew's question about the the definition of crisis so effectively there are two i would say ways that people have used have tried to define crises and they don't always agree although the differences i think are in the end minor they come down to you know do you date the savings and loan crisis in the US in 1984 when it started or 1988 when there were peak losses and things like that. But people agree there was a crisis in the US in the 80s. Um, one is what we do, or what I've done in my work with Alan and Oscar is to use sort of a narrative historical, you know, identification where you say like, okay, in 1931 in July, there was trouble in German banks. And you say like, was that systemic? Was that more than an isolated event? Did it trigger large-scale interventions? 
um, was there evidence of panics, etc. And if if these things check out with some, you know, um, then you call it a systemic crisis. There are cases like I don't know, you know, Mike Bordo. My is it was 1923 or 1907 a crisis in Canada, and you can discuss this forever. And um, some will say, yeah, it was because it was eight banks. And I'll say like eight banks is not systemic. I need more than ten for to copy. Things like that will happen. My honest assessment is for the questions we're interested in, these things don't really matter, these slight definitional changes and, and timing differences. Um, you know, Rand and Rogoff have a classification, um, Barry and co-authors have one with Bordeaux. And, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, did the banking crisis in the US in the Great Depression start in 1929? Or do you code it as 1930 or 1931? Um, and by that, you know, in the big scheme of things, that doesn't. Everyone agrees there was an issue with U.S. banks in the early 30s, kind of. Um, the other way, this is what we use here, is not from is not our own making, but is from like more maybe more finance perspective, and that is from um, a recent. I think it's out now. At least it's definitely accepted QJE paper by Matt Barron, Emil Werner, and Wei Xiong, who uh, date banking crises by. Um, using the um, the decline in the bank stock index. So they say when bank when the value of bank equity falls by more, I think it's 30% within a year, uh, that means there is trouble at the bank. And um, then they'd use that to date crisis. Again, the overlap is huge. Uh, we're talking about the nice feature that this like marked or price-based dating of, oh, the value of bank equity drops like a stone, so something is going on um classification has is that it typically precedes the peak of the panic by you know six months eight months ten months something like that so if you think about 2008 the bank stocks dropped in the beginning of 2008 bear stearns went under in february etc and sort of then the peak of the panic was september when lehman failed and and, and the fall so you see that quite frequently in the data that the bank stocks fall ahead of the actual you know, peak of the crisis. So for our purpose here, you want to give the Fed or the ECB a chance to intervene already in February 2008. They don't have to wait until the fall. So that's why we use this. Otherwise, I don't have a strong view. I think, um, no, but this goes too far. But sorry, I didn't answer that before, Matthew. And um, that will, um, will we, we, we try both classifications and these results for the paper very soon. Thank you very much. I, I, think, I think it's time to end the conference here. Yeah, just a few minutes late, so I think it's still reasonable. And uh, so let me thank you again very much, uh, Moritz and, and Mathieu, for Thanks this for uh, last very nice discussion, awesome. and, and all, all of you to all the participants and presenters uh, today. And uh, Alain, if you want to, to say the last word, or just uh, or Francesco, Tobias, and uh, and again, thank the, the, the Bank of France and, uh, and Paris School of Economic Chair who, who supported this conference. And I, hope, I hope it was useful for everybody. So thank you very much. Let me just jump in there and oh, yeah. uh, so, yeah, a, big thank you. Thank, a big thank you to uh, all the speakers, to the audience, but in particular to Eric and Alain who did such a great job in putting this program together. So thanks, thanks very much to everybody. Uh, I think it was a very interesting afternoon.